Invasive species are thriving in our forests and oceans. In turn, they are changing the natural systems and the delicate balances that produce our food, as well as protect our homes along the coastlines. Just one invasive species can affect an entire ecosystem. For almost 50 years, the Chesapeake Bay has been fighting off an invasion of a nearly invisible enemy. They've been arriving here for four centuries. They've been moved here by many different means, unintentionally, often with ships, on the bottoms of ships, or in the ballast of ships. Water that's taken on in one bay or estuary and moved to another port. The presence of one invasive species is most obvious in its victims tiny white-fingered mud crabs, barely the size of a quarter. The invader, an almost microscopic barnacle, renders the crabs completely infertile and forces them to reproduce its own offspring instead. This parasite called Laxothylacus panopii is a type of barnacle, but it's not the type of barnacle that most people think about. It's not the kind that you see growing on locks and rocks along the shore. Rather, it's a highly modified type of parasite that's basically designed and tailored to be a parasite of the crab. Yeah, I don't know whether that's two individual parasites or whether it's the same parasite that created two different sacs or externia on the crab. It not only makes them infertile, but it forces them to produce the larvae of the parasite. It doesn't matter the sex of the crab, they infect, they infect either, either sex. But what's fascinating in the male it makes the male crab think that it's a female so that when that parasite is sitting here, the male treats it as if it were a female crab, as if it was having its own eggs there. So this male crab will oxygenate the parasite, will keep it free of any kind of fouling organisms that are on the parasite. So effectively, it turns it into a little girl and it keeps the parasite happy. The way it works is, a female barnacle will bury itself into the crab's body, and soon a new sac-like structure will emerge on the crab's abdomen. The female parasite will then wait for a free-swimming male barnacle to come along and fertilize it, producing thousands of larvae within the sacs. As you can appreciate, a parasite like this barnacle that comes in and essentially castrates or causes reproductive death of those individual crabs that are infected could have a big effect on the overall population dynamics. It's basically removing a portion of the population from successful reproduction. Researchers first discovered the barnacle in the Chesapeake in 1964. The team at CERC has been monitoring their presence in white-fingered mud crabs since the mid-1990s. In 2003, they started doing annual surveys at 10 different sites to see how many crabs were infected. One of the ways we've been tracking the prevalence, the abundance of the barnacle on crabs is to put out small crates that are filled with oyster shell, essentially crab condos. And so we call this a crab collector unit or a CCU. What it's filled with is these are all oyster shells, so these are dead oyster shells. And these are used because they're good habitat for crabs. So these are our little uh, crabby homes. They aren't traps. The crabs can come and go whenever they like. But because oyster shells are often habitats for crabs, the hope is that a fair number of them will stay and the team will be able to study actual populations. Then, the researchers go back and pull the crates up to see what they've caught. But it's not enough just to know how prevalent the invader is or how much damage it's doing. In order to know how to stop this invasive species, the researchers also want to know why it's able to succeed and where it does. Well, there are actually several different factors that determine how well an uh, invader does in a new, uh, new environment, but two of the most influential factors are actually temperature and salinity. The Chesapeake Bay has many freshwater sources, such as rivers flowing into it. The low salinities near these freshwater inputs may be a factor in what conditions the parasite has the best and least chances of survival. To test this idea, the researchers have been exposing crabs with parasites and crabs without parasites to waters of different temperatures and different salinities to see how well they cope. It may be that the crab would be able to survive a broader range of salinities than the parasite would. So what we've been testing is, is exactly that. 
So here we've got our different salinity boxes with the crabs. So in every box we have three crabs that have parasites and three crabs that don't have parasites. And so for instance we have a, a one box that's near freshwater. So freshwater is zero parts per thousand. So this is 2.5 parts per thousand. So that's this one. And then this one would be a little bit higher, so maybe five parts per thousand. And then this one is 10 parts per thousand. So this is normal bay water that you might even get out at Cirque Dock right now if we were to go test it. And then we take these and we put them into our three experimental temperatures in the, in the incubators. While the crab may be able to survive a broad range of temperatures and salinities, the parasite might not. And it appears that the parasites actually have a much lower tolerance to fresh water. So during periods of fresh water, it appears right now that um, the crab is able to um, shed the parasite, essentially the parasite dies. And so um, following that, the prevalence of parasites in the crab population has declined dramatically. So in the low salinities, the parasites don't do very well at all. In fact, they don't survive. But once you get into the, the higher salinities, the ones that are more closely to maybe what we see in the larger areas of the bay, they do very well. Since 1964, this species has already spread from the Chesapeake Bay to Florida. Scientists hope by studying it, they'll understand how to stop it from hurting other crabs further south. But for the white-fingered mud crabs of the Chesapeake Bay, it may be too late. Well, if the parasite continues to thrive, it could have massive repercussions for the entire ecosystem because it prevents an entire group of crabs from reproducing, and that's a big deal. But the solution at this point, now that it's here and established, is uncertain. It's an example of an invasion that is, has been highly successful. When that happens, it's very challenging to control or eradicate a species like that, which is why a lot of the focus in the U.S. is on trying to prevent new invasions from coming in, reduce the likelihood that those will occur. That's a much more efficient and pragmatic approach in general.